I want to say another prayer, but I first want to tell you that Pastor Tim had planned to preach the second service today. It doesn't sound like he'll be able to do that. And he sent me a picture of his, his right hand, and it is just so swollen like a balloon. Um, so we want to lift him to the throne as well um, and then pray for the service and pray for Danny. He's going to deliver the message today. And um, I know he'll do an awesome job. So let's just pray for the service. Lord God, you know, um, for those of you who are able, would you mind kneeling as we pray for Pastor Tim, if you're able to do that? Lord, we come, we come before your throne so humbly, Lord. We don't deserve to be able to enter your throne room, but your word says, by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, we can go before you boldly. And so, Lord, we do that today on behalf of our pastor. Lord, we pray that you take that swelling down, Lord. Lord, we, we've seen him go through so much suffering, and it just breaks our heart every time. But, Lord, we just come before you and ask that you'd relieve it right now that your healing power would flow out of him, flow over him, that it would uh, course through his veins, Lord, that whatever's causing this swelling, whether it be any blockage or whatever it is, I pray that it would just stop, that you would just knit him back together, his, his nerves, his joints, his sinews, his muscles, just continue to heal him. Lord, it's been an incredible miracle so far, and Lord, we just... Uh, in faith, believe it's going to be another miracle today. So, Lord, just help that, that swelling to go down. Lift him out of that sick bed, Lord. Help him to be able to come later today for the, the business meeting. And we just thank you and praise you, Lord. We do lift up this service to you. Lord, we know you're in this place. Man, it's just so awesome to come here and feel your Holy Spirit working so mightily. Lord, I lift up Danny to you right now. I pray that you would just speak through him, Lord that he would be your mouthpiece, and not one word that comes out of his mouth would be of himself or of his flesh, but it'd be totally of you, that it would be truly just the oracles of God, your oracles, Lord. We thank you for your precious word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for this precious time that we can gather together in your name. And Lord, you say when we gather in your name, you're here. We claim that promise today. We thank you and praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, one last thing. Uh, we do have our, our business meeting today at 3 p.m. If you haven't picked up your annual report, it's out there. It probably has your name on it if you're a member. Um, we also have absentee ballots in the back. Uh, Joe has absentee ballots. If you are not able to attend and you are a member, please grab one of those and fill it out before you leave today. Okay, thank you so much. God bless you, Danny. You done with you? All right. So how many got the pleasure of hearing Pastor Tim last week? <clears throat> it was awesome. <clears throat> My wife and I were in Texas, but we watched it uh, on the streaming site that we have. And what I thought was really cool is Pastor struggles with his breath a lot and having the ability to keep, uh, keep enough breath as he's talking. And I didn't notice that hardly at all. He seemed totally just energized by the Lord. And even though he talked a big game about it being a short service, I'm pretty sure it was long as usual. And so we just know he's back going full bore. So he won't be here today, but that doesn't mean it's going to be short. <laughs> Nervous laughter. They're great. I want to talk about the assurance of salvation today and why we doubt. I, I know I can speak for the rest of us who come up on this pulpit. It's a humbling thing to come up here, and the biggest desire of our heart is not that we just come up here and say what we think is something we need to say, but that it is something that our, our Father has given us to say. We want to make sure that we're speaking that is, which of, is of God. And as I sat down and talked with Pastor this week, I told him I wasn't sure what I was going to preach on, but I just kind of, God had put something on my heart about the assurance of salvation and why we doubt. And he actually confirmed it in that um, talk uh, when I was talking to him. It was really neat. And then the next day I was talking to John, and I think it was kind of confirmed then too, 
But what was really special to me, I don't know if you guys, how many have heard about Rocco, uh, John Crocioli that passed away. He, he sent out a group text frequently to us. And I'll level with you. I don't read every group text. I'm just going to say I don't. But sometimes I do. And I, he sent one out on Wednesday, I think it was. And I hadn't actually read it yet. And then when I found out that he had passed away, I decided that I wanted to go ahead and read it. And it was exactly what God had told me to preach on. And it was just so cool. It was kind of his little parting gift through Rocco. And his text said this. It said, When you are faced with difficult situations and problems, do you trust God to make anything work together for good? Jesus came to confirm that God loves you unconditionally. His care and compassion are unquestionable. If you are sure of this, then you will be assured that Christ will not allow anything to harm you. He wants what's best for you. With this assurance, you can trust God unconditionally and everything you undertake. Amen. I've exposed myself many times while I'm out here as far as the fears and the different things that I deal with. God has allowed a thorn in my flesh uh, for His glory, because in my weakness He is made strong. And that thorn in my flesh is, I'm kind of a doubting Thomas at times, and I tend to be introspective. A, a psychologist would probably, I know for a fact, they'd say that I suffer from um, obsessive compulsive thoughts. And there's been many times when I've asked God to take it from me, and he's said he won't. He's not going to at this point because he uses it for his glory. But Satan also likes to take that and attack. And in the midst of those attacks, he likes to try to strip my assurance of salvation. He likes to get me to question whether or not God truly does love me. And what I've experienced in my life is when I go through those times of doubts, and I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I believe this is something that is so prevalent in the church and is oftentimes not spoke about, is how many people live in questions and doubt and whether or not they're truly saved. And sometimes they have these moments of joy when they really truly know and there's this boldness, and other times they live in hidden secret doubts to where they're just wondering, am I truly in the kingdom? And I don't know about you, but being 99% sure of spending eternity with God is not enough. Uh, 0.1% is too much doubt for eternity. And today I really have it pressed upon my heart that God wants you to know that you are saved. God wants you to have that assurance. But on the flip side of that, he also wants to speak to the heart of those who are presumptuous and live in habitual sin, that God's word clearly defines you out of the kingdom of heaven by default, if this is the way of life for you. And so I really hope to speak to both parties in this regard, as in, in this message. And the text that I want to preach out of today is found in 1 John 5, 12 through 14. I'll be preaching mainly from the New King James. I do have um, the, the King James as well in one of these, but the New King James is what I'll be preaching out of this morning. As I was, as you guys were turning there, as I was heading to Africa for the last time, the last time that we went, I remember being in the middle of a big 777 across the ocean. I don't like heights to begin with. I know that flying in a plane is, they say it's the safest travel, but you're 30,000 feet in the air in something that shouldn't be in the air, and sometimes it rattles, and I've been in a car wreck. In fact, I just was in one. I was rear-ended three times, and um, just one summer one time, I was rear-ended by a drunk driver without stopping in my little Toyota Echo. Praise the Lord, we made it out of that. <clears throat> but I walked out of every one of those. 30,000 feet in the air, and the thing starts doing one of these and shaking. I'm going to level with you. I get a little bit of anxiety. And I remember the last time I was flying to Africa, uh, I believe Satan himself was trying to rattle that plane. And I started to get a little bit of anxiety brewing, and my wife, bless her heart, she falls asleep on the runway before the plane takes <laughs> off. I could get, like, no sleep for two days, be exhausted, and as soon as I get in the plane, I'm like, just wide awake. So I was sitting there in the middle, and it was so neat, and I know I've shared this before, but it's just, it was just such a comfort to me, because I looked up on the screen, and if you've ever been in a plane, and it shows your flight path, and, you know, it kind of shows where the darkness is and the light and where your, your plane is actually going. And our plane was exiting the light part on the map. And it was getting ready to go into the darkness. 
And God just put it on my heart so much that that's what we were doing, that we were getting ready to just go into the darkness. But the neat thing was is that, and I'm, I'm going to level with you. I'm going to pastor Kurt during this message. I am going to tear up, okay? So, but the neat thing was is, because God really touched my heart this week, you guys. It was, it was an amazing week. Is he told me that this plane was going to land. And for me, that assurance was just, thank you, Lord. Because I don't have a lot of faith in men, to be honest. And I don't have a lot of faith in myself. But if I know God has me beyond a shadow of a doubt, then I have boldness that I can't explain. And I knew as that plane was rattling in the turbulence, God said to me, he said, that is all Satan can do to you. He can try to rattle your cage. He can try to inflict fear, and he desperately wants to, but that's all he can do to you right now. And I just had a peace, almost a, almost a, a laughter, that I, if I remember right, that came upon me that you can't touch me if God doesn't want you to. That assurance of salvation is huge, and it is a vital thing that we as the body of Christ must walk out in every day of our lives. Because if we go out in doubt, it's a difficult road. 1 John 5, 12 through 14 says this. It says, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. A line is drawn in the sand right there. It's not all roads lead to heaven. Jesus came and he said very clearly, There is no other name under heaven by which men might be saved. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. This is not a popular message nowadays, but that's okay. It's not supposed to be. Jesus said they hated me. They're going to hate you if you're doing it right. I believe this congregation is under attack by the enemy. And I don't say this with arrogance, but I believe it is under attack by the enemy because we're doing something right. Okay? We are abiding in the Spirit. We are following after our Father, and the enemy hates us. In fact, I had that confirmed to me twice this week by two different people that Satan hated me. It actually made me feel good. Verse 13 says this, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. For today's message, I want to discuss three really important things. Okay, obviously the importance of salvation. We'd be amiss if we came and gathered and we didn't talk about the importance of salvation. But I also want to talk about this. Can we know beyond a shadow of doubt that we are saved? Why do so many people doubt they are saved? And how can we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are saved? So for the first topic I want to talk about, it's the importance of salvation. Now, I understand that most people, a lot of people in this room, understand the importance of salvation. But let's not conclude that because we do, everyone does. I believe that there's been a terrible gospel message preached in many churches and in many places for many years. And I grew up, and I'm not saying I had a terrible message preached to me, but I grew up under the misunderstanding that if I said a prayer at the altar and invited Jesus into my heart, that I was saved. And while I went out into my life and did drugs and got drunk and had sex and did these different things, I remember when the, when the fear would come and different things would come that I... I just knew as long as they said, Jesus, come into my heart, I was good. And I really, truly walked in that for a long time. I really believed that as long as I made that little deal with God right there, that everything was okay. I came to the altar many times and cried tears emotionally and was never saved. And so I think it's really important that we discuss what it truly means to be saved. When I go to Africa, it's a really easy question. We go door to door. Africa trip, just so you know, is all evangelism. We don't build a thing, and I'm not against that, but we don't build a thing. We go there. There's a year before we get there, there's a whole bunch of pastors that live in those areas that are trained up to be pastors in their neighborhoods and communities. We come alongside them and say, tell us where to go. And we go door to door to their neighborhood, knock on the door, and tell them about Jesus. If they, if they make a profession of faith in Jesus, we invite them to a Bible study. We disciple them. We leave a bunch of money with the pastors. We encourage them, pray for them, and then there's a whole follow-up that comes afterwards after we've been there. It's all about preaching the gospel. That's all it is. But it's a really good question to cut right to the core. We knock on the door, and we ask them, you know, we introduce ourselves, and we ask them, if you died, would you go to heaven? And a lot of them would say yes. But most of them will say this, and will say, well, why would you go to heaven? They'll say, because I'm a good person. I do good things. I've done a lot of good work. It cuts right to the core. It shows someone's true heart. Very rarely do you hear anyone say, 
I have totally placed my faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So we get the privilege of being able to explain to them an accurate gospel. And an accurate gospel is not a complicated gospel. An accurate gospel includes scripture. Sometimes I think we want to speak too much and let God's word, instead of letting God's word speak for itself. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means each and every one of us are born into sin. If you think that's not true, just, just witness a newborn someday. Just witness a toddler someday that instinctively know how to be selfish, that instinctively know how to be all about themselves. We are born into sin. It's, it's not even a question. We are. But many people downplay the significance of sin and, and the, the absolute disgust that God has for it. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That means something that we've earned. That means each and every person in here, whether you want to believe it or not or accept it, we are going to die. And when we die, we're going to stand before a very loving, just creator. If he is a good judge, he is going to give us the right sentence. And the right sentence is guilt. The right sentence is death. The right sentence is eternal separation. To give you an example, how many of you, when you heard about the judge lowering Kyle Odom's sentence down to assault when you first heard it, got a little irritated, okay? I'll be honest, I did too because I didn't understand why. What kind of judge would do that is my thought. Why would you do that? We demand that he be a good judge. So do you also understand that that mindset, we're demanding that God be a good judge too? And if we stand before a good judge like God, we need to understand that we are comparing ourselves not to human crimes. We are comparing ourselves to divine righteousness. And in the presence of a living God, in the presence of heaven, in the presence of perfection, there is not one room for error. There is not one ounce of leniency given to where sin might dwell with God. And I'm thankful for that because I don't want to spend an eternity around proud liars and habitual murderers and, and arrogant people. But that's who I was. And when I stand before God, I'm going to be judged, let's just say off the Ten Commandments, how many of them would you pass? We'd stand before God eternally guilty. That's every person in this room when we're born. No amount of good works can stop that. I remember a famous billionaire giving billions and billions of dollars to some charity. And he made a comment along the lines of, well, at least I now I've secured my place in heaven. I almost think he really believes it, too. The problem is, is that means nothing to God. The poorest person in the world that never gives a dime to charity could place their faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross and spend forever in the presence of God. God's word says we are born into sin and there is nothing we can do about it. And to a lot of people, that's the terrible news that needs to be heard. But the good news is that Jesus Christ died for those very same people. And that for God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. On the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. And what he meant by that when he said it is finished is that every single thing, every single sin that mankind has ever done, I have taken the punishment for right now. I have paid for every sin, past, present, and future, and have taken the full wrath of God upon me because he's a good judge, because you could not handle the judgment. There's no way we could. So I took it as the Son of God, and I paid for your sins. Now it's up to you. Do you want to accept it? That's the simple gospel message. But too many people want to take that gift and walk their own way with it. When Jesus says, no, you need to give up your life and follow me. And if you're willing to do that today for the first time, if you're willing to turn from your way of living, embrace Jesus Christ by faith, and follow after him, God's word says, you will, not might, not maybe, not possibly, you will be saved. And that is the greatest news we've ever heard. <clears throat> I don't have the most up-to-date statistics at all, but I've heard that around 80% of Americans claim to be saved. Of those 80% of Americans, I've heard that approximately 20% attend church regularly. Now, I'm not saying that coming into a church building makes you a Christian, but the concept of being born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and not fellowshipping with the saints and having love for brethren is completely foreign to Christianity. A mark of a true believer is a love for the brethren, other Christians, a desire to be with other people. This becomes more family than unbelieving family when you're truly born in the Spirit of God. So, 
while I'm not going to say who's saved and who's not, the fact that only 20% of Americans regularly attend a church fellowship is sobering news. Now let's just go out on a limb and say that just say half of those 20% of the people that actually attend church regularly are truly saved. Here's the staggering statistic that I found. The USA has a population of around 322 million people. 80% of that is 257,600,000. 20% of that is 64,400,000. 10% of that is 32 million. By my math, that leaves 225,600,000 people shocked on the day of judgment. People that think that they are truly saved walking in the faith because they made a profession of faith like I did or they made a prayer or something when they were young. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is heaven will enter, in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So in other words, he says, depart from me you who are practicing habitual sinners. It's a sobering verse. You guys, an accurate gospel message is not a simply feel-good message. The accurate gospel message is that there is terrible news and there's a way to escape it through faith in Jesus. But Jesus says very few are going to do that. He says, in fact, many will seek to enter but will not be able. And that's not because Jesus rejects any person. In fact, we'll, we're going to talk about that in a minute, how Scripture says that's not the truth. It says, many will seek to enter but not be able to. And I've, I've witnessed that with people before. People that want so badly, they believe that Jesus is the way. They want so badly to surrender their lives to Him and follow Him, but they're too drawn to sin. They're too drawn to the flesh. They're too drawn to this world. And even though they want it so bad, they just decide to take, like the rich man who wanted eternal life. He knew it was the way to eternal life, but he couldn't get rid of his wealth. I believe that's many people today. I pray that today the Holy Spirit would convict us. For those of us who are believers in this room, I pray that he will comfort us and encourage us, and he will just fight off the attack of the enemy that wants to get us to constantly doubt and wonder if God truly loves us. But I pray for those who have never truly made that uh, profession of faith, whoever truly had been born again like I was the same way for 20 years of my life, I pray that the Holy Spirit will convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment, but that that will not lead to condemnation because that is not God's plan. He said, I did not come to condemn the world. I came to save it. Conviction and its hardest, most powerful pulling is never to make us feel hopeless. That conviction from the Holy Spirit is to make us feel hopeless in ourselves, but to see that there is a blessed hope in Jesus. And when we turn from that and we embrace Jesus by faith, there is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ. Amen? Salvation is obviously important, so can we actually know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are truly saved? I believe wholeheartedly the answer to that question is yes. I've heard it said by multiple people. I don't know why. That, that we shouldn't ever have assurance of salvation, that we will we'll only know when we stand before God if we are ever truly saved. I totally disagree with that. And I believe the Lord wants us to know that we are saved. I go back to this passage in 1 John, and it says, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. And in verse 13, he says, These things I have written to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you can know, that you should know, you have eternal life. The book of 1 John was written to an established Christian church. And John, the apostle whom Jesus loved, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was combating two things. He was combating those in the church who are living in open heresy, basically saying they could live how they wanted, they didn't have to believe true things about Jesus, they could habitually live a life of sin and still be saved. He was telling them, that that is not true. He said nobody born of God continues in a habitual life of sinning and that those who say they know Him and do not keep His commands are a liar and the truth is not in Him. So he was combating the heresy of presumptuous sinful people that think going to church on a Sunday is all they needed to do and saying, no, you're missing it. But then he was also comforting the precious sheep in God's flock. Those who truly, humbly, contritely have said, Jesus, I give my life to You. I trust You. I want You. I need you. But yet they were plagued with doubts. 
Yet everything in their life looked. You look at their life and say, why do you doubt? You have all the evidence of salvation. You have a love for God. You have all of these things. Paul says in Thessalonians, he says to lift up the feeble-minded. We need to understand that maybe this doesn't really just completely resonate with you, but there are people that have weaker consciences. There are people that have what God's Word says is a feeble mind, where they are not as strong in their faith. They are not as strong in their assurance. And Paul thought it, or excuse me, John, who wrote this book, thought it was extremely important to encourage those people. We need to remember that when Jesus' disciples went out and they came back and talking about how excited they were, Jesus told them to rejoice that their name was written in the book of life. How can we rejoice if we don't know our name is written in the book of life? Or maybe we just half think it is. I find no biblical message that states that we cannot know that we are saved. Imagine just walking around, 85% sure you're saved. That's, that's good, you know, I was not the greatest student in high school, I did okay, I would have been just fine with an 85%. But 85% sure, that's not enough. I need to know that I know when I go out before a world that hates me, an enemy that seeks to kill me, I need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I have God living in me. Satan is a very powerful enemy. We do not want to go to war against him, 85% sure. So question number three, why do so many people doubt that they are saved? First of all, some questioning is good. I think it's very good. In fact, 2 Corinthians 13.5 says this. It says, examine yourselves as to whether or not you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. Or another translation, it'll say, unless indeed you fail the test. So in other words, you look at the fruit of your life, compare it to Scripture, what God says, and you say, that doesn't line up. I think it's, it's good at times to take that spiritual inventory. I believe that a person, I, I truly do believe, and I know this is a debated thing in church, so I'm not going to get into it big time, but I truly do believe that a saved person can walk away from faith. I believe there's plenty of Scripture that alludes to that. And I think that we need to know that and we need to take those times to examine the fruit in our lives. Because if you're anything like me, you, you can be saved and love Jesus and then you can get really distracted in the things of this world and you can start building your kingdom here really quick. It's really easy to do. It's really easy to become complacent. It's really easy to just kind of settle in. And that slow fade in complacency can turn into a disobedience if we're not careful. So I think it's extremely important for us to stop at times and say, Lord, where am I? Am I good? Kind of look at my life and see where it's going. We need to examine ourselves. Don't just think because you've had a definitive salvation experience that you're still in the faith today. God's Word says only those who persevere to the end will be saved. In fact, that's found in Hebrews chapter 3, 14. I know I'm kind of going through these verses fast, but I'm trying to get through this. It says, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. No racer has ever been awarded a trophy for finishing 99% of the race. I don't care if that guy took off like Usain Bolt and he was ahead of the pack for lap after lap after lap after lap. If he finishes one foot before the finish line, he's done nothing. That's the same way with our walk with God. It doesn't matter how strong we start. It doesn't matter how much work we do for God's kingdom. It doesn't matter how much love we have for God. If we drop out of the race right before the end, there's no possible way we can conclude that we are saved. It is only those who persevere to the end. So when we examine ourselves, this should be a time of joy or conviction. So how do we examine ourselves? How do we know we are truly walking in the faith? Here's what I'm going to tell you right off the bat. Okay? First and foremost, it's not about feelings. And I'm not against feelings, but that is not what we judge anything in our life off of. Okay? I, could, I could wake up one day and, and, and not have feelings for my wife. It's not true. I absolutely love her with all my heart. But I could wake up one day and not have feelings for my wife, and that doesn't change the fact that I still love her and I can take care of her and do those things for her. If I base everything in my life off of feelings, then you guys are going to want me off the stage really quick. Because I'm going to be a poor example of a solid believer who walks the walk if I'm just going to go off of how I feel every day. I've met people that swear they love God. I've met people that are so convinced that they love God, but yet you look in their life and you're like, Jesus says if you love him, you'll obey him. When do you, when do you check that one off your list? I've met people that swear they love their spouse, but yet 
I'm sure of this. I, I can't think of it offhand, but yet they're unfaithful to him. So just saying that you love someone or having feelings is not the way we examine ourselves. We examine ourselves by Scripture. And the best test to examine ourselves is open up the book of 1 John. If you will open up the book of 1 John and just read through it, it's one of my favorite books in Scripture. It, it, it's so not gray. It is so black and white. I'm going to take you through 12 little quick things here. I'm just going to tell you where the scriptures are at. You can write them down. But here's how we, here's how we compare ourselves and examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. 1 John 1.3, do you enjoy having fellowship with Christ and his redeemed people? Number two, would people say you walk in the light or walk in darkness? That's 1 John 1, 6 through 7. Do you admit and confess your sin? 1 John 1, 8. Are you obedient to God's word? 1 John 2, 3 through 5. Does your life indicate you love God rather than the world? 1 John 2, 15. Is your life characterized by doing what is right? 1 John 2, 29. Do you seek to maintain a pure life? 1 John 3, 3. Do you see a decreasing pattern of sin in your life? 1 John 3, 5 through 6. Do you demonstrate love for other Christians? 1 John 3, 14. Do you walk the walk versus just talking the talk? 1 John 3, 18 through 19. Do you maintain a clear conscience? 1 John 3, 21. And do you experience victory in your Christian walk? 1 John 5, 4. Many of these passages have a positive or negative context to them. They'll say, um, here's how you may know that you love God. Or this person is not born of God as we look through this test. We can examine ourselves in the light of Scripture. Now what God is not demanding that we have perfected every single one of those. But what should be evident in our life is that each and every one of those things are something that are growing to some degree in our life. That we can look at and say, yes, I see this fruit in my life. And that is how we can examine ourselves and say, yes, Lord, I, I, I believe I'm walking in the faith. We don't line it up with our feelings. We line it up with God's word. But back to the question, why do so many people doubt they are saved? And I'm not referring to presumptuous, habitual, sinning people that confess the name of Jesus. These people should doubt that they are saved because God's word says that you're not. I'm referring to the precious lambs in God's kingdom that show the fruit of salvation in their lives, but they live in these times, these realms of doubt. Some days they walk in bold confidence and, and hope and assurance that they're saved, and other days they just feel like, I can't possibly be. They're on their face humbly crying out to God, but they think that there's just no hope because I can't possibly be saved. Why does this happen? Why does this happen so much? For starters, Satan wants it to happen. I've learned this very much in my life, and God has confirmed this. Satan wants to and tries to get you to doubt your salvation. What I've found in my life, that when Satan can't drag me back into my sin, when Satan can't drag me back into my lust, when Satan can't drag me back into my perversion, when he can't take me away from Christ by bringing me back into a world of sin, he begins to attack my mind. He begins to go after my mind, and he begins to whisper doubts into my mind. He begins to try to get me to doubt the fact that God actually loves me because what happens is I start to give in or I start to listen to those voices. I then, not that I'm going back into sin, but I shrink into doubt and lack of assurance and then I become a very fruitless Christian because I don't have the boldness that God wants me to have. When I go into JDC and talk to the kids, if I'm having those times of doubt in my life, if I'm, if I'm struggling, then I feel very timid. But if I know beyond a shadow of a doubt God is with me, I can stand up in boldness and just preach the gospel with joy and excitement. Satan wants to strip that from you. Satan wants to strip that from me. <clears throat> if Satan can get you to doubt that you're saved, we're going to lose hope. We're going to lose joy. We begin to become less bold. Satan desperately tries to do this. I was watching that new Benghazi movie that came out um, 13 hours. By the way, I was watching it on clear play. You might want to do that if you watch it. Uh, you will have lots of the movie muted out, but that's okay. But you have these heroic soldiers that are standing post in this, it's kind of like an embassy type of thing, or kind of a temper, I don't know exactly what it was, but they're holding off all of these attackers coming against them. And you can see them in their bravery, and, and they deserve the, the honor that is given to them. They deserve to be recognized as heroes. And I pray that we put a government in place that will actually support our heroes from now on. But as, we, as they stood there and they went to hold off the enemy, one of the things that they kept asking is, was there help coming? Was there people coming to aid them? 
Are these friendlies? Are these not? And I remember at one time when this help came in, they were so relieved and they felt so good. And they held these people off and then these mortars started coming and it got really ugly and this whole train of just people pulled up and to them it was like it's over. They were like, man, uh, this is probably it. They were hopeless. They didn't feel like they had any help. But then they realized that it was friendlies. Then they realized that it was support coming in to help them. And they just wept. That's how I feel like it is with us with God. If we know God has our back, if we know He has us, we stand and fight. But when we begin to doubt that He is there, we shrink back and we feel like this is not going to work. We must know as believers, God is for us, not against us. You guys, God passionately laid my, this on my heart this week for this, this congregation. He loves us so much. I think we give God a bad reputation sometimes as, as kind of a cruel dictator that kind of rules the world from afar and he hopes that we get hopes that we mess up so that we can be punished. I feel that way sometimes. The reason that it it kind of gets me is because as I was I was dealing with something this week and I just felt like a failure. I think it actually was last week. I just felt like a failure, and I was. I should have felt like a failure because I failed. And as I went before God, and I just started to repent, I think we're programmed to wait for the consequences sometimes. Give me a minute. <clears throat> I think we're programmed to wait for the consequences sometimes. But as I laid there before God, repenting, He said so clearly to me, He said, I still love you the same. Don't deal with doubts. Man, that's tough. I know it's awkward for you guys when someone does this. I'm trying not to. But if you don't deal with doubts very often, maybe you don't understand that when assurance comes, it's wonderful. I'm really trying. <laughs> God has been so faithful. I remember, you know, I told you he gave me the thorn. It keeps me weak. Maybe I'd be arrogant if I didn't have it. But I remember one time we were going out to, um, I didn't even know we were going to, but I was having one of those moments, and Joe Daniel, who is someone that God uses so mightily in my life sometimes, spoke to me. And just, he just assured me randomly, so randomly, of how much God loved me and put it on his heart to tell me. And I just had this amazing assurance. Little did I know later that night that I'd be a part of two demon-possessed uh, demon men that we were going to have to deal with. And one of them was an actual exorcism that we had to be a part of. And if I went in there with any doubt, you guys, I would have tried to run out. It was scary. I just, I just had this faith, and God gave me this faith and this assurance that he had me. It was so wonderful. And God is so faithful. I don't have time to go through all the message that I have. It's already 10.05. I have a lot more. But what I want to assure you with is God is so faithful that if you're walking in those doubts at times, here's something that you can really do that's cool. You can serve God anyways. You don't have to feel like you're saved in order to follow after Jesus. You can just follow him because he's worth it. Because one thing that I've realized is that God is so faithful and that when I feel like I'm coming to that point to where I'm just... God, where are you? He always shows up. Even if I think he hasn't, he always shows up. He's always there just to give me that much. But yet he allows me to walk in that other place to build my faith. And I think that's where true love for God is shown. 
is when you serve him when you don't feel it. You serve him when you doubt. Today I stand emotional because I just, God has shown me. That's a great feeling. There's many other reasons as to why we doubt our salvation. Sometimes we read hard passages of Scripture that we don't understand. You need to know that Satan knows Scripture better than you do. Satan will try to use it against you. He was arrogant enough to use it against Jesus. The Word made flesh. You don't want to try to use the Word against the Word. He knows the Word. He is the Word. But the way Satan combated that is he, I mean, excuse me, the way Jesus combated that was that he used the word against Satan. Anyone ever read about the unpardonable sin and had a little nervousness? Okay. Anyone ever read passages in Scripture and felt a little nervous? I have. Satan will take those Scriptures and twist them and try to use them against you. But just remember that one Scripture can't contradict another. And if you're ever reading God's Word and you feel like maybe you're disqualified, just understand that Jesus says, no matter who comes to me, I will never cast out. And if you confess your sin, He is faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness. And all means all, all the time. And no matter what the enemy tries to throw at you, just understand that God's Word will always stand. We have a weapon against the enemy. We need to know it. We need to use it. Don't compare your conversion to other people's. Teddy Roosevelt said, Comparison is the thief of joy. Don't look at your life and say, because I don't look like Stephen Hemming, I can't possibly be saved. Don't listen to the testimonies of other people and question your own testimony. Don't wonder when you were converted and under, say, maybe I wasn't because I can't remember the exact time, the exact day, the exact hour. I don't. I really don't. I just know that there was a season in my life when God radically changed my heart. I can't tell you the time. I don't need to know the time. I can't tell you when I was born either, but I know I'm born because I'm here. I've heard the testimony of many famous and non-famous godly men that don't know the exact minute of their conversion, but they know in their heart they've been changed from who they were. It's not about a moment. It's about a way of life. How are you living now? Where is your heart now? Don't compare yourself to some of these other testimonies that say it may seem big when they come up on stage and delivered from all these crazy, amazing things, and just it's just radical, and you're like, man, I just gave my heart to Jesus one day, and that's kind of it, and I love God, and maybe, no, don't question that. That's a testimony in itself. Paul was hammered on the road to Damascus. An amazing conversion experience. Matthew, the tax collector, here's his. Come follow me. Okay. He followed Jesus the rest of his life. Oswald Chambers says, never make a principle out of your own experience with God. Let God be as uniquely individual with other people as he is with you. Now that doesn't mean we come through a different gate other than faith and repentance. But that means the way that God draws us to that gate isn't always the same. Don't look for something in the past. Look for a life in the present. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, God, unworthy before, but God made worthy by your Son. And we come, Lord, we don't have to come timidly, Lord, though we come with respect and reverence. We come boldly to you because you're our Father. And you love us. Thank you for loving us, God. Thank you for giving us your Son. Thank you that you're not angry and distant. Thank you that you do not take pleasure in the death of the wicked, God. Thank you that it is not your desire that one single person that has ever perished would perish without repentance, God. Thank you that you love us. Thank you, Father, that you give us the ability to know that we are saved. Father, help us not to doubt what your word says. When we compare our lives to your word and we line up our lives with your word and you say, if you come to me, you'll be saved, then, then why should we doubt that? It kind of comes down to us calling you a liar. We don't trust your word. Let us trust your word, God. Thank you for this message, God. It's, it's for me. The message of love. The message of assurance. That we can walk in that. We can live in that. We can exist in that. And we are much more powerful soldiers for your kingdom when we know that. Because if we think we are of any use, of any good, without your spirit in us, then we are desperately wrong. So thank you, God, that we know that your spirit is in us. I pray for those here today, God, that maybe have been presumptuous, 
Maybe, Father, they have never truly been born again. Maybe it's been nothing but head knowledge and a prayer. Father, I pray that where they're at, you would draw them right now to you. Father, we don't need always altar calls and music. We need your Spirit. We need your Spirit to draw us, God. We need your Spirit to convict us of sin, convict us of righteousness, convict us of judgment, to understand that we cannot continue to exist and live in our own selfish ways and habitual life of sin with no repentance and think that we're truly born again. That is totally contrary to your word. Because anyone that has experienced being born again knows that you just cannot exist in the realm of sin as a way of life. It's disgusting. So thank you for that heart, Lord. Thank you for changing our heart. Thank you for giving us victory over sin. And I pray for whoever those people may be here today, God, that today would be the day that they confess their sins truly before you and they repent and place their faith in Jesus and walk after you with all their heart, no matter who follows. Though none go with them, still they will follow. I pray for those of us in this room, God, that have those times of doubt. Father, we first ask that you would take that thorn. But if not, God, that we would trust that you're still there and your grace is sufficient for us and that in weakness you are made strong. So I pray, Father, that we, in those times of doubt and those times of wondering where maybe the enemy is getting to us, God, if you're allowing it for a season, I just pray that we would serve with all of our heart, without feeling, serve with all of our heart, without knowing, because you're worthy no matter what. And you are worthy no matter what, God. Thank you for the honor and the privilege of being an ambassador for you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, God. I believe your church needs to be filled to the fullness. Father, may we never settle for complacency. May we never settle for just a little. May we never settle for just being saved. May we be totally sanctified and filled with your Holy Spirit, Father. Go out in boldness to preach your gospel and disciple your people. We love you, God. We need you. We do come to you again as we do, Lord. As you say in your word, like the widow and the unjust judge, we come to you and we come to you, God, and we intercede for our pastor. Father, we just pray that you would touch him. We know you will. We know you have him. We know he's right where he's at. The enemy hates him. The enemy wants to devour him, God. But you only allow so much, and we thank you for that. You step in and say, that's enough, and the enemy flees. That's our God. So we pray you would touch him today, Father. You pray that you would touch his arm. We pray that you would touch his mind. You pray that you would touch his whole body. But Father, only in your perfect time. Because I believe you're doing something with him right now. I believe that in this time right now, God, that you are conforming, Pastor, more into the image of Jesus. And we thank you for that. So Lord, let it not be our time that we demand, but always your time. We love you. Keep us safe as we go throughout the rest of the day. God, please be with us as we go to Africa. Please be with the body as they're here. I just pray, Father, for your guidance. I pray for your protection upon um, all of us, our families. And we'll give you all the glory because you are good. We love you. In Jesus' precious name we pray.